Welcome to AIJ Philadelphia Design Conversations. I'm Bernardo Margulis, and today I'm speaking with Stefan Sackmeister, renowned graphic designer, principal of Sackmeister & Walsh, and co-director of The Happy Film. You have a very prolific design career, uh, and you're known both for client projects, self nature projects, yet you only take a set number of clients or projects a year, and you take a full year off every seven. Can you tell us a little bit about that sabbatical uh, mm -hmm. experience, why you do it, and how does it, that affect your work? Well, yes, very much so, because I'm on sabbatical right now. Uh, so this is the third sabbatical that I'm doing. The first one, I just stayed in New York, because it was so new that I couldn't even think of doing it somewhere else on top of it. Second one was in Indonesia. The third one I started the first four months in Mexico City, then four months in Tokyo, where I'm just coming from and I'll have another four months in front of me in a tiny village in Austria. The first one, I think, really needed a lot of guts from me. Like, the first one was really, I was worried about all sorts of things, that we're going to be forgotten, that I will have to start the studio fresh afterwards, all these things that happened, didn't happen at all. And a couple of things that I thought would happen did, as in I would have the time to work on bigger projects and that uh, the outcome would be different if you have a full year to work on it rather than a weekend or so. And a couple of things that I didn't expect happened, as in every single time I went on sabbatical, the studio afterwards really went into a new direction and that was very good. It was good for from a selfish point of view for me because it kept everything alive and fresh. And it, I think it was good from a work point of view because I could step back and really look at the bigger picture and make necessary changes. Let's say the first seven years from the studio we were very much engaged in designing CD covers. And then in the sabbatical I decided, okay, we've done enough, let's try something completely new. Then of course two years later the music industry collapsed through the whole online download. The most important thing that came out of it by far would be that it resets my own view of design and make sure that I'm still able to see it as a calling rather than just as a career or just as a job. Now, that first sabbatical you did in New York, in one pad talk you mentioned that you didn't have a plan for it. Mm -hmm. And you didn't call it disastrous for that reason. Yeah. Uh, but in other talks you mentioned that all the great projects you did over the next six years derived yeah. from those experiments you did in that yes. sabbatical. Yeah. With that outcome, why do you think it was disastrous and you still, do you still consider that? Oh no, the first sabbatical was totally a success. I just, the start was a disaster. Okay. So the, the I basically, purposefully didn't make a plan because I'm a big planner and I thought uh, that big space would be a fantastic experiment by itself and it just didn't work. You know, I was busy with things, returning whatever. At that point I think faxes and sending, uh, sending slides to Japanese design magazines who wanted them. Uh, but I, I was busy but I didn't produce anything without a plan. And then that after two or three weeks that was so frustrating that I sat down and made a very tight plan. Mm -hmm. And also I kept that, meaning I now have a plan for this sabbatical. And of course by now also quite some experience what is healthy for me, like how much should I plan and how much I shouldn't plan. And what works for me well is, I have a, at the beginning of the sabbatical I have a whole, a whole list of things that I wrote down into a little folder, stuff that I was too busy to do in the normal working hours. And then I look at, on the plane to Mexico City, I look at that list and I get rid of half of it because it's not interesting anymore. I might have tried it already, but it didn't work. And I, I think I ended up with six or seven things. And then I order them into a hierarchy and I put them into a weekly calendar. Uh, and now I just basically so like settled settle for, I think, 20, 20, 20 hours a week. Uh, but, but it's very much like kindergarten. You know, like, uh, Monday morning from nine, to, from 9 to 12, this. Tuesday morning from 9 to 12, this. Uh, and 
normally, like in, let's say in the second sabbatical, after three or four months, I could forget about the plan because so many projects were running that I didn't need mm. a schedule anymore. On this one, because I'm changing cities, I'm actually keeping the plan. And I have certain rules, like when I'm traveling, like right now, you know, on tour with the film, I'm not fulfilling the plan because it's just too busy with all the flights and the planes and the hotels and the pre-check and stuff. But uh, as soon as I'll arrive in Austria, I'll for sure go, I'm sure for the first month on a plan, on the plan, and then it's probably stuff moves by itself. Is it a liberating thing that you can be off the plan knowing that's not uh, client work? Yes. Yeah. And it's just, oh, uh, you know, it's projects that I come up with myself that I find inherently interesting. Oh, uh, yeah, it's wonderful. It's, I mean, it's literally like uh, going to, like, starting the sabbatical was sort of like a light switch in enthusiasm for design. Now, your second sabbatical was in Bali, yeah. and the biggest outcome is the happy film, which yeah. we're going to see tonight. Um, what, why did you pick happiness? What drew you to it? Well, what happened was that uh, uh, I was in Bali, and there was a good number of people in the studio there working with me. And we were, uh, so like one of the main things that we worked on, definitely one of the most visible things in the studio, was furniture for our own studio. The studio was being renovated while I was gone. And the idea was we'll just make, design the furniture, have a prototype or two made, and that's going to be the furniture. And uh, a friend of mine from New York, a very good friend, came by and he looked at all these prototypes and he thought that this was pretty much a waste of my time. Or he thought that I had some sort of obligation to be involved in something that people have something from. That's, that, mean? that means that he thought that I had an obligation to, to create something, I don't know, for the betterment of humanity okay. or for like, you know, that's, that's somehow more fruitful for an audience than doing furniture for my own studio. And uh, I thought about that and I felt that he had a point and then interrupted the furniture designing, we finished the furniture anyway and thought about what that could be. And at that point, I had already done a, a, a talk about design and happiness that was very much about, you know, is it possible to create a life as a designer that would increase your well-being? And is it possible to create design pieces, our pieces of design of such power that they could elevate the well-being of a user? And uh, that talk had always gotten very good feedback. So I thought, well, I could make a big project out of it, which would force me to do the research, which I wouldn't do if it's just a personal interest. And uh, I thought a film would be a good idea because I've never done one, so it would be a challenge. And I thought if all goes well, maybe I'd be even happier at the end of it from doing all the research. And. Uh, the idea at that point was that it would be like a year, a year and a half project, and much has happened since, meaning it turned out to be a seven-year project. I mean, literally, you know, it took up the entire time from that sabbatical to this sabbatical. Uh, it was much more difficult than I had thought. The challenge was much bigger than I had thought, uh, mostly because there was a big gap in my sophistication as a viewer of films versus my sophistication as a maker of films. And that created a lot of uncomfortableness. Uh, uh, but it's done. It's done and I'm uh, extremely... I'm now extremely happy that we did finish it. That was, there were uh, a number of occasions where that was in serious question, where we really thought maybe we just leave it, you know, and cut our losses and say, okay, we put four years into this now, but let's just forget about it. And I think one of the main reasons we didn't was because there was a side project that came out of the film, which was an exhibition called The Happy Show, and that was 
extremely successful and generated an incredible amount of feedback from visitors. You know, people who sometimes were designers, but most of them were not designers, wrote me long letters about what that exhibition meant in their lives. And so I think that was probably the main, or definitely my, my main sort of branch to hold on to, to get the energy to finish the film. So in a way, your sabbatical affects your client work, but then your commercial work affected your sabbatical project. Well, the, I wouldn't really call the, 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 the exhibition a commercial project. You know, it was really an outcome. Uh, it was a side project of the Happy Film, and therefore was also self-generated. Sure. Meaning that there were, if you can call it, clients involved because it traveled from museum to museum, but museums don't tend to act like a regular client. I mean, yes, you have to hold the deadline and yes, you have to deliver things within a budget. But outside of that, I mean, we didn't have many disputes about content or so. You know, they pretty much let us do what we wanted to do. Um, so you tried meditation, psychotherapy and drugs, yes. each one for three months. Yes. Why, how do you respond to every one of them? And what's your verdict? Can you control happiness? Well, I'd say that uh, it, it, uh, it was meditation first, because I thought I'll start with the most difficult one. And as an outcome, I would say it opened me up for bigger questions. Not during meditation. You know, in meditation, you're supposed to not think at all. But in the day that followed, let's say, a morning meditation, I was definitely thinking about bigger things. Now, of course, the sabbatical is also pushing that, but the... Uh, the meditation actually was no forget about that the meditation actually was not done in the sabbatical mm -hmm. so the, so uh, we, uh, that really came through the meditation the, uh, it was cognitive therapy really it's a, a difference to mm -hmm. psychotherapy uh, cognitive therapy I think turned out to be really commonsensical and very understandable, let's say, as opposed to psychotherapy that lasts for years. And I've talked to many people in psychotherapy who, after 15 years of therapy, couldn't really quite tell me for sure if they got better or not. Cognitive therapy is very straightforward, limited time that uh, felt much closer to my personality. And I think the most wonderful outcome from it is that I learned that I actually can change something about myself. So if there is an aspect of my personality that um, I'm not uh, that I'm not satisfied with, I can actually now, or specifically in the future, go back to Sheena, uh, ha take another ten uh, sessions, and work on that, and know that. The more I do the homework, the more engaged I am myself, very much likely the, the more it will work. And drugs, in my case, I think, in the, as you'll see in the film, probably worked too well, but I could definitely see going back on them, probably in a much lower doses. Mm -hmm. And I talked to our overall scientific advisor, Jonathan Hyde, who is sort of a big name in, uh, in positive psychology, and his view on he uh, on drugs in my case was, was Lexapro which is sort of similar to Prozac it's in the same class of drugs was that if you go to a it, let's say you have low heart low low blood pressure you probably would go to a doctor and she would she would prescribe you a pill that would normalize your blood pressure and Jonathan says why not do the same if you have low serotonin levels mm. why not up that and it's very clear, and I think that there's pretty much an agreement among scientists that, uh, that about 50% of your well-being is genetic. So you're just, some people are just born lucky. Uh, and so there is something you can do about it. Now, we did not make a pro Lexa pro film because we actually financed the film by me doing talks about the non-finished film. Mm. And so I, in the talks, of course, I also talked about Lexapro. So after the talks, many 
people, sometimes two or three, would come up to me afterwards and confide that they're also on Lexapro. And of course, I would ask them, and I heard every single story. Didn't work at all, worked fantastic, worked in the beginning, not in the end, worked in the end, not in the beginning. So it seems that people really react very, very differently to it. Now, I assume that that would be the case for the other experiments too. Ultimately, I think all three of them worked, but a little bit. None of them changed my life around. So what would be your key takeaway? Uh, from the film? The, yeah. A different one. And it came at a time when I didn't expect it to come at all anymore. Basically, we have uh, Jonathan Haidt saying in the film twice, once in the beginning and once towards the end, that his real key insight after writing his whole book was that ultimately I would have to try to get all my relationships, this would include far acquaintances to a lover, to family and good friends, onto some sort of plateau or into some sort of healthy situation where happinesses can arise from in between. And the same would be true for my work, that I would lift my work up, that I would uh, create the platform for a work, for my work, where that is possible. And the same would be true for something that's larger than myself. And I've heard, I've read his book before I've ever started or had the idea to make a film about it. I've, uh, in, in the editing process, I've heard him say this a hundred times, and I properly understood it eight months later when I started in Mexico City, mm. which was, yeah, I just at one point, I really deeply understood it, including sort of a warm feeling above my belly, where I had, that's exactly what he really meant. And I found that to be true with a good number of things that I can, with my mind, dissect it and say, well, that's actually pretty banal, you know. Of course, if you have all your friends and relationships on a good level and all you work on a good level and, all, and something that's bigger than you on a good level, of course your, your well-being is going to be higher. But there is still a point where I when I truly got it, it was actually very helpful. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your experiences on sabbaticals and the happy film. To learn more about the film, please visit www.thehappyfilm.org. Thank you to Brian Bettinger for helping us coordinate this recording, Stacey Toslin for helping with the questions, Don Monty for recording and editing this video, and Brian Evans for music for the series. To learn more about our organization or to listen to past episodes for the series, please visit philadelphia.aiga.org.